Good afternoon and praise the Lord. The Lord is good and all the time. Please smile. Mambi, do it for me. Bridget, smile. Aine, are you with us? I am so excited to be back. I... I almost got tempted to call a few people to ask if they missed me or not, but I kept looking at my phone, there's no message, there's no beep. I said, God, do these people even miss me? Bambi said, you missed me, so I feel good. Did you miss me? Malcolm, are you sure? (laughs) Yes, I'm excited to be back. I want to thank God for the few days of rest. I do not take it for granted. I had time with my baby, uh, my son, my small baby, not the big one. Yes, I also had time with my husband, so I thank God for that. So today we are reflecting on Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Now, for those of us that love to watch movies, especially movies that are action-packed, eh? action-packed movies. I want to recommend that you find some time and go through the book of Acts. Eh, eh? I am very serious because in this book, we see a lot of action. We see many things happening. Some people call this book Acts of the Apostles because the apostles are being used by God to do a number of things. But the truth of the matter is, it is not the apostles at work. Well, there is some effort they're putting in, but it is the Holy Spirit at work through the apostles to bring about this action and the many things happening. But I also want to say that this book is actually a continuation of a big volume that Dr. Luke started for us. And so as you begin to read in chapter 1, he actually tells us, I am continuing where I stopped in my former book. Please quickly go with me to Acts chapter 1 verse 1. And this is what it says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And so he continues and he gives us an occasion on which before going back to his father in heaven, Jesus told them an instruction. And so he says in verse 4, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so he continues. And why I have read these beginning verses is for us to know that the writer is not simply coming from space to write this. He has given us an account of the ministry of Jesus up to when Jesus was actually taken back to his father in heaven. And so he's building up on that that he had previously written in the gospel according to Luke. And so he continues. Now, before Jesus went to heaven, we all know his mission. He came to die for us. He died our death. If I could use that English, he paid our price. He died for us to reconcile us back to God. But in between his coming and the time of going back to his father, he had come and lived life with his disciples. He was doing life with them. He had created a bond with these men. They were colleagues, they were friends. Permit me to say, some sort of buddies. And now, 
after all this time, Jesus says to them, you know what, I am going back to my father in heaven. So imagine having spent some time with your friend and then he suddenly says, you know what, I am going. It is not a good thing for you to want to have your friend go. But in the midst of that, Jesus tells them, in as much as I am going, I am not going to leave you as orphans. In fact, it is for your good that I go back to my father so that he can send the helper to you. And as we come to the book of Acts of the Apostles, aware that in the Old Testament there is a promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit, friends, in Acts of the Apostles, that promise comes to pass. It is fulfilled as these friends are troubled, our friend has gone to his father, we seem to be left alone, we seem to be alone. What then are we going to do? They're somewhere in the upper room gathered together. I'm thinking probably praying and seeking God. Lo and behold, as we go to chapter 2, we read that the day of Pentecost actually comes and they receive the promised helper that God, through Jesus, had promised. Now quickly go with me to chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. And this is what it says. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. I want to thank God that he is a giver of a promise and he actually goes a long way to fulfill this promise. The promise had been given, remember in the book of Joel, I will pour out my spirit, lo and behold, it is indeed poured out in Acts of the Apostles. Now, as these people are baptized with the Holy Spirit, there seems to be commotion in that area. People think they are drunk. People think they are confused. And before I actually go to our verses of concern this afternoon, God wants us to understand that the Holy Spirit accomplishes a number of things in our lives. And I remember there was a time we had a series on the Holy Spirit and the gifts and things like that. But as people think these people are drunk and confused, my mind goes to Peter. Remember Peter, a friend, that used to say things without thinking about them first? One whose mouth went ahead of his heart? Remember Peter at the fireplace, threatened by a little girl. The girl points at him and says, you know what, it seems as if you are one of them. And I think because Peter feared the, that that had happened to Jesus, he said to the girl, I do not know you, I am not part of them. At the coming of the Holy Spirit, friends, Peter is clothed with boldness that it didn't matter to him anymore whether the people he's speaking to will actually also want to crucify him. And as an evangelist, he seizes the opportunity, he begins to preach the message of his friend, his savior Jesus, resurrected. And as you continue to read in chapter two, Peter addresses the crowd from verse 14. And as he addresses the crowd, his message is so straight out, so much so that people say to themselves, what then do we do? The message cut them to the heart. Now the Holy Spirit not only makes us bold, he also convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. As he made Peter bold, he walked through the people that were listening to Peter to be convicted of their sin. Peter points out what they had done. The Lord gave us Jesus, you killed him, and he reminds them, by the way, 
He is now, in verse 36, he is now both Lord and Christ. You crucified him, but I want you to know this day, he says in verse 36, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Hallelujah. And as the people listened to Peter's sermon, they said to themselves in verse 36, 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Conviction has taken place. Their sin has been pointed out to them and they want to be helped on what they can do so that they put things right. Now, many of us love the other part of being made bold, but when it comes to the Spirit of God pointing out our sin, many of us do not seem to be pleased with that. And yet that is equally the work of the Spirit of God among us. It was impressive for the mighty wind to come. It was impressive for tongues of fire to come. Peter's sermon was equally impressive, but so was the act of conviction that caused these people to come to the knowledge of Christ. So Peter tells them, you know what? You want to know what to do? Repent and be baptized. Verses 38 to 40. He says, repent, come back to God. Come back to God, come back to your senses. And thinking about this word repent, before I go into our verses, to repent is to completely turn around. If you are headed this direction, you get to have a complete turnover and go into the opposite direction. The direction they seemed to be moving in was one led by the adversary himself, so much so that it caused them to ask Jesus to be crucified. Not so many verses behind. I want to believe among the crowds that were saying, what do we do? There must have been a few of those that said, crucify him, crucify him. And so in calling them to repent, Peter wants them to turn around. He wants them to change their thinking with regard to who Jesus is and what he is able to accomplish in their lives. It is completely turning from your own ways and turning to God. It is living something and walking towards God. It is walking away from sin and self-righteousness and daily seeking Jesus and walking by his grace. He calls them to repent. He calls them to be baptized. He calls them to put their faith in Jesus. Now, thinking about being baptized, as I did some reading, I discovered that um, if you told a Jew to be baptized, it would kind of be offensive. Because Jews thought they had it all, they were already right with God. They had reserved baptism for some of those uh, Gentile converts. If you got converted as a Gentile, probably will have to baptize you and do some more cleaning of you so that you are somehow close to us. But notice that the receiver of this message, Theophilus, then, but also us, well, particularly him, basically could be looked at as an offense. How do you tell a Jewish man to be baptized? In their mind, they're already right with God. But Peter points it out clearly, we need to be baptized. We need to be cleansed of our sin so that we can put our faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In calling them to be baptized, Peter wants, um, wants them to acknowledge that they are sinners that need cleansing, and this cleansing can only come to them if they surrender to the Lord. Now, the beauty is, Peter says, 39, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, and that is where you and I come in. 
Gentiles brought in, and for you who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So whoever will believe the promise is for them. He continues in 40 with many other words. He warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And as we transition into the passage read, I started like this because it is important for us to acknowledge, to appreciate what the passage is saying. Our passage begins from 42, they, and you're thinking, who are they? Now the they is the people, or these are the people talked about prayer. 41 upwards, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number. Peter preaches, they accept, they are baptized, they become part and parcel of the body of Jesus Christ. It is these people that we are talking about in verse 42. They, those that had listened to the sermon of Peter, those that had received the conviction of the Spirit of God about the dirty and sinful thing they had done, those that desired to put things right, those that believed and accepted. It is those that we talk about in verse 42. They believe and they come to the knowledge of Christ. And I thought to myself, in this age and era, as we think church growth and quality, there are so many things we have tried to do to bring people to the knowledge of Jesus. In fact, for some of us in our salvation journey, every time we want to share the word of God, in our hearts we are praying, God, may I don't live up there until someone comes to your knowledge. In fact, at times we want to beat ourselves because we are preaching and no one seems to be responding. And I said to myself, God, how did Peter feel having preached that powerful sermon? And not just two or three, but 3,000 came to the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So those that came in verses 42 to 47 come to the fall. But because they have believed in Jesus, that that they had received, they allowed it to fashion their lifestyle. They did not simply leave it behind. And as we go through verse 42 to 47, we are going to see that the lifestyle therein is because of something that had, taken, that had happened in the inside of them. They had received Jesus, and so because they had, they carried their lives in a way that suits that that they had received. And so in verses 42 to 47, we are going to see a change of lifestyle. We are going to see a transition. And as we go into this transition, allow me to say to us, friends, this afternoon, that the test of the work of God in your life is not just what happens on one glorious day. Not on that day of confirmation or the day you receive him as Lord and Savior. It is not just in that one glorious day. It was not on, in that day of Pentecost, but rather in what happens after that. The test of your faith in Jesus is not whether you will stand up or not to receive him. It is not whether you've been confirmed or baptized. It is in whether after all those rituals or activities have happened, how then are you going to fashion your life? How then are you going to live your life? Unfortunately, many of us do not pay a lot of attention to the afterwards. Many of us are into the heat of the moment. We are excited, we feel good, but then after that feeling, we fail or we forget to carry our faith into how we live our lives. Not so with the disciples. Not so with these 3,000 that came to the knowledge of God on the day of Pentecost. We are told in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
Their lifestyle is said to have been one of devotion to four things. One, the apostles' teaching. The word of God as handed down from the apostles. It concerned them to desire and to want to grow. And because they wanted to grow, daily they committed themselves on feeding on the word of God. And because they did, day by day they grew and the Lord added on their number. And talking about the word of God, what is the place of this word in your life? Now for many of us, well, which is not bad, but I would want us to think together. Uh, many of us have those Bible apps on our phones. And some of us are so lazy that as the day comes, you simply tune it on. You let it read the Bible for you. And that is like the only Bible study you will have for the entire week. You wake up today. Is it click? You, you, eh? you put it on. It reads the Bible for you. You cannot even memorize what passage it read. That is how you are feeding. Can I say in as much as that is food, it is, it is kind of junk food. Not so good for our health in terms of how to grow. So if we desire to grow in the word of God, may God open our eyes to understand that we need to feed on his word. We need to diligently study his word. We need to be rooted in his word so that when winds of wrong doctrine come around, our roots are deep, we are not going to be shaken because we know what God's word says. But tell me in the midst of heresy, if you are only feeding on that voice Bible that you listen to, how are you sincerely going to grow? So devotion to the teaching of the apostles, to the word of God. And these people are devoted because they desire to grow in the faith that they have come to. They have accepted Peter's preach, they have come to the knowledge of Christ, and they want to grow in understanding. Friends, God wants us to use the totality of our being as we come to him. But many of us are blindly following. We have not given serious thought to these things of our faith. But I also know there are some of us that think it is a sin for us to want to question some of the things that are said here. It is not. God has given us this intellect and he equally wants us to use it for his glory. He wants us to come into his temple with our hearts in as much as he wants us to come into his temple with our minds, with our brains. No wonder he calls us to reason with him. How then are you going to reason if you left this out there? So he wants the totality of our being to study his word. Praise the Lord. These people were also devoted not just to the teaching of the apostles, but also to fellowship. Coming together as brothers and sisters, united by one common thing, the common denominator being Jesus, irrespective of color, of race, of our financial muscle, as we come together, what should primarily bring us together in the first place as sheep, fellowship, is Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Now, pausing to talk about fellowship, unfortunately, there's, there are fellowships in our circles that are not healthy at all. And permit me to say this with, with, with no bad intentions. For many of us in our fellowships, our denominator has ceased to be Jesus. And what seems to unite us is the happenings. We want to feel good. We want to, it, it, it is a kind of a social gathering. It is kind of a hub. We, we want to meet together and simply catch up. Friends, when it comes to fellowship, numbers are very important. And the smaller 
the better so that everyone will participate, so that everyone will grow. Now, unfortunately, at times, because we are so many, some of us are lost in the crowd. You're part of a fellowship, and yet you're somehow journeying as a loner. You are part of a group of people that are excited to meet together, and yet you have struggles that you cannot even open up to anyone. Unfortunately for many of us, fellowship is no longer genuine fellowship, it is plastic. When people meet, they do not want to say what they are going through because for some of us, it has turned from prayer request in court, it is kind of gossip. For many of us, as we come together and we want to open up, you know what I am going through this, please pray for me. A sister or brother in the Lord will be tempted probably out there to bring it as a prayer request in court, and yet they are gossiping. By the way, do you know what that girl, she's going through this, you know, we were meeting, we were praying, but now she said this, and that alone is chasing people out of our fellowships. They have ceased to be warm, they are cold, they are no longer safe spaces. And God is calling us to rethink this month. He has called us to be warmer in our fellowships. He wants us to open up our homes or places so that when people come in, there are issues of the heart that are dealt with. People are free to speak because they know my brother, my sister will hold my hand. What is the, the state of your cell or your fellowship as I talk? Is it a place where people feel free to open up or for many, people simply sit. Fellowship should be a place where when we meet together, you actually know what someone is going through. For many of us, we, we do not seem to know that. The church in the beginning had members that not only opened up their homes to people to come, and by the way, <laughs> for those that are hosting, opening up your home is a tall order. Because for people my age, well, I'm not so old, when we come to your place, we'd want to have something to eat, some little tea. And so it is not just your chairs or your space. We might need some black tea or probably some ground nuts. Mrs. Kawoya makes some nice cake or probably have part of your cake. And so you realize in opening up your space for people to come and fellowship, you are also opening up your wallet. And John Wesley, <laughs> uh, the, the founder of the Methodist Church, one time said that the last part of a man to be saved is their wallet. The last part of a man to be saved is their their wallet, in other words, people will quickly open up their home, but they will not quickly want to open up their resources for others to come and use them for the glory and honor of God. And so if we want to grow together and be warmer together this month and going forward, the call is for us to be committed, one, to the word of God, but also be committed to fellowship. Friends, in genuine fellowship, when someone falls down, the other will lift them up. But in fellowship, that is fake. When you fall, no one will be there to raise up your hand. And because there is no one to raise up your hand, many of us have decided to leave fellowship, and that is what the devil wants. He wants to target and put you in a corner so that he will pounce on you alone. Friends, we cannot journey this journey of salvation alone. But as we come together and people give testimony in fellowship, you are encouraged. You are encouraged. You say to yourself, well, if you went through that, I believe God can take me through this as well. How then will you have encouragement if you are journeying alone? May God open our eyes to understand that we need to grow together. You need other people 
in as much as other people need you. So they devoted themselves to studying the word, to fellowship, to breaking of bread. They ate together. They ate together, not just on table, but also kind of what we do on Ministry Sunday. Eating together, building a bond together. They also devoted themselves in prayer. I'm talking about eating together. A story is told uh, by one of the people I went to university with. He was our papa. One time he hosted us for sale. And then we used to have that thing of, of hot seat. So one time we put him on hot seat to, want to find out how he met his wife and what. And then he said, ah, well, I'm not saying for each of us that is why we'll find our, sp our, our, our spouses. But for him, it was in fellowship. And he said um, he loved how this, 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 this lady would eat. I don't know, but so we all thought, okay, for us, we have gathered to study for you, looking at how someone is eating and chewing. And you see some of us, some of us will chew and a brother will say, hey, is this a lady? Hey. <laughs> they ate together. They ate together. So he says the way she was chewing, I don't know what about her chewing enticed him, but well, they are married now. I hope he was not lying to us, but for him it was... Ouch, she ate. But they also prayed together. They prayed together. Four important things that they were committed to that caused them to grow together as a church. Now, talking about this word commitment, commitment is when you do that that you're supposed to do, whether you want it or not, whether you feel like it or not. And so whether they felt like today I should go to sell or not, they pushed themselves there. They were committed. Whether they felt like praying together or not, they were pushed into that. I pray for myself as I pray for each one of us that God will give us commitment in terms of these four things. Commitment to his word, commitment to fellowship, commitment to breaking bread together, but also commitment to prayer as a body. They shared everything. And talking about sharing everything, my mind goes to what they do towards the end of a passage. Verse 45. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. And my mind went to Ananias and Sapphira. I said, well, if these two failed the test, how much more do we fail on a daily basis? But then it occurs to me that these people had understood who Jesus is and were content with him so much so that their physical possessions could not compare to that. Imagine, probably you got saved yesterday, you're in fellowship, a brother says, you know what, I do not have where to stay, I do not have food. You go home, sell your plot of land and bring money to meet the need of that brother. God, I, I, I pray that we get back to that. Mrs. Kawoya is doing this. Imagine selling your possession to meet a need of a brother. Friends, this was not a selfish church. But for many of us, when I have what to put on, when I have food, when I have where to sleep, it is okay. God is good. Many times we do not seem to want to think about other people. By the way, do you know that you can meet for fellowship and everyone is smiling, you will have that cup of black tea and ground nuts and that would be the supper for someone. Do you know? Hey, you people. Hey, I admire your life right now because 
you don't you don't know i know you I know those buns. Eh? Imagine if we ate that bun and black tea. And for me, that is the supper. But for you, you don't know. You're smiling on because you're looking forward to going back home and having supper. When they met and a brother said, you know what, I do not have fees. That cow, eh? Go sell that cow, bring the money. Friends, would we pass that test? Would we pass that test? May God open our eyes to know that we can let go of some of these things for the sake of the name of Jesus. They sold their possessions and gave to meet the need of a brother. And many times these needs we cannot know unless we are meeting. We cannot know unless we are meeting and people express themselves, people share. But also in this fellowship, they shared almost everything. And it dawned on me, do, do I personally, do I really, really share all I have to the people I have opened my home to? And I want to share a testimony of a sister. She's, um, well, she has not given me permission to, to say this testimony, but... She, uh, I'll be in her good books because she will not take it offensively. So this sister, you know, I'm married to a priest. So we have our small group. They called her to come and speak to us, to encourage us as people that are married to priests. And then she told us a testimony of how one day she was so tired of people coming home. You know when you're married to a priest, eh? People come, reverend, pray for us, reverend this, and when they come, you have to, to give them something. And so she said to herself, okay, I'm not going to be making fresh juice every day because manya what do that. So she went and bought, you know, this powdered, powdered juice. So she bought her sockets. She would make the fresh one for her husband and hide it in the deep freezer so that when people come, she'll be a good wife. She'll offer a glass of juice but it is not fresh. And so she would pour in her jerry can of, of boiled water, and when you passed by, you would have a glass. But one afternoon, someone that had previously tested the juice that she gives her husband, one day said, eh, Ruth, eh, sorry, I've said the name. <laughs> in Luganda, eh, trying to say the juice this time tastes a bit different and so she burst out laughing until she said the whole Uganda let me walk in light you know I've been struggling this so <laughs> so I improvised this and the sister rebuked her and she was telling us, you know what, at times you can get tired of serving these people. Then she told us of how when they come and there are lots of plates to clean. Uh, and then she told us one time of how a visitor came and a parent, uh, her father was a bishop, said, you know what, surrender your bed for the guest. And then, ah, how much are we willing to offer of all we have? to those that we open our homes for. May God help us, especially living in a city like this, we do not know who is really a, a, a real brother in the Lord or sister in the Lord. And yet the call is for us to open up our homes, open up our resources for them. We need other people. Other people equally need us. And so if you want to grow together and be a replica of the church in Acts, we need to let that that you have believed, the faith you have put in Jesus, influence how we live our lives. The decisions we do on a daily basis should not be divorced from the faith that we have. In fact, our devotion to the word of God our devotion to prayer, our devotion to fellowship, our devotion to wanting to share 
should all be coming from that point because we have given our lives to Jesus and so we need to do these four. At times it is not easy. I know there are people like us who would want to say, this is my space. I do not want anyone to encroach on it. But you see many times as we hide in the statement, this is my space, there could be things we are battling with and we might not fight them well when we are alone. We need a brother to hold our hands. We need a sister to hold our hands so that we can grow together. These people believe the Lord. They do not divorce their belief from what they do on a daily basis. On a daily basis, numbers were added to them because of their devotion to the word of God, their devotion to prayer, their devotion to fellowship, their devotion and unity in everything. And that devotion caused other people to want to come and join their fellowship. So I want to pray for us this afternoon that between now and for the rest of our lives, God will open our eyes to rethink our fellowships. God will open our eyes to rethink the quality of food we eat in our fellowship, the spiritual food, that God will open our eyes to rethink the motivation for our meetings, that God will open our eyes to understand that in as much as these physical possessions are important, they are not the ultimate thing. God desires us to open our hearts to him. He wants us to open our houses or places to him. He equally wants us to open up our resources for the glory and honor of his name, especially if we are meeting a need of a dear brother in the Lord, a dear sister in the Lord. Friends, reading through Acts chapter 2, we see a church whose belief in God is influencing the things that they've chosen to devote their lives to. I want to pray for myself as I pray for you that God will help us and understand that our lifestyle should not in any way be divorced from our faith in him. At times it is difficult, many times we fail, but he's able to carry us up. He's able to help us. We want to thank you, Lord, for this model of church life that we see those that went ahead of us dedicate their lives to. Thank you because they had grown up so much so that they did not pride in their possessions, but they were willing to give them up for the sake of your work in extending help to a brother or sister who had need. We read of a church that was united a church that had unity of purpose. I pray, Lord, that you will unite our purpose, that, Lord, you will cause us to yield our lives to you, that you will help us understand that in our fellowships or meeting together, we are basically coming together because of you, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so may that common denominator, Lord, influence everything that we will do together as a body of believers, may it influence our lives. We give you thanks, we give you praise, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you.